Tony. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'm Karina Sephora and welcome to Connect and Create. Um, we're at episode 45 today and we are so lucky to have the wonderful and amazing uh, Jamie Bourgeois with us today. And, um, and thank you everyone else for being here. We may have some more people that are joining us throughout the morning. And we also have people that will be joining us on Facebook Live as well. Um, before we get started, I'm gonna share just a little bit more <clears throat> with you a little bit about how Connect and Create began. Um, sort of at the beginning of the pandemic, I found myself with a lot of extra time and um, some friends of mine started a morning uh, Zoom talk show and I was a guest speaker and I loved it so much. I kept inviting all of my friends to be on their show and come to the show. And then I thought, well, maybe you, you should start a show yourself. And so I did. And, um, and part of the other reason was that I missed certain things that we did, like going out to art openings and socializing and meeting new people and having chance encounters and connecting with other creative human beings. So I thought, it's the next best thing. And um, before I introduce Jamie formally, I want to also give a thank you. Um, I received a grant from the Fulton County Council for the Arts. Um, an initiative grant for starting this um, this show. And so thank you to Fulton County Council for the Arts for um, your generous um, uh, funding. Uh, <clears throat> and um, Jamie, anything you'd like to say before I give your formal um, introduction? I just wanna thank everybody for being here uh, for my presentation today, but you can get started. Okay, great. <laughs> So, and I'll share also, I met Jamie um, because she works with the gallery that I recently started working with about a year ago. And so we get to interact and um, speak about the artists in the gallery's work, speak about my work. And I've always been really curious about your work and your process. And um, so I'm really looking forward to um, your presentation today. Thank you. So, um, Jamie, I'm gonna share a little bit about Jamie's professional, um, professional life and um, there we go, that's taken care. So um, Jamie is a textile artist and illustrator and Jamie Bourgeois examines the impacts of human interactions with local ecosystems. Born in Southeast Louisiana, she grew up in a family with a tradition of harvesting resources from the land. In an area now known as Petro, as the petrochemical corridor or cancer alley. This part of the country steeped in paradox is still and will always be home. Bourgeois uh, is a multidisciplinary, excuse me, Bourgeois's multidisciplinary works investigate and highlight the confluence of nature's tides and man's industry. He creates utilitarian textiles with a goal to remind and raise awareness of the importance of protecting our native ecosystems. As all geo, e geo systems interconnect, her process for creating these textiles is intentionally low impact. Utilizing plants, insects, and minerals as her dye sources, Jamie graduated from the visual arts program at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts in 2008. She received a BFA in fibers from the Savannah College of Art and Design in 2012. And her studio is currently based in Atlanta, Georgia, where she also works as the gallery manager at Spalding Nick's Fine Art. So please welcome um, Jamie Bourgeois. Thank you so much for being here. And um, thank you all of the rest of you that are here in the audience. And Jamie, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And while she's getting that set, we will have some time um, towards the end for question and answers and comments. All right, so hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here today to hear about my work and my process. Um, my name is Jamie Bourgeois. Oh, let's see if I can get this to go. My name is Jamie Bourgeois. I'm a textile artist, illustrator, and natural dyer based here in Atlanta. I create naturally dyed and printed uh, utilitarian textiles, mostly scarves, all with the goal of spreading awareness and sparking conversation about our local native ecosystems. 
And all of my works are dyed and printed using natural dyes. And this is sort of a bit of a snapshot of my process in creating one of my scarves. And I'll just go through this um, a little bit quickly. And I may say some terms that some of you aren't familiar with, but there'll be time at the end for questions. So I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Um, so I start all of my scarves with a blank uh, natural fiber. Usually it's either a silk or a silk cotton blend. I um, scour and mordant the fibers to prepare them for dyeing. All of my uh, dyes that I use are prepared from uh, raw materials from different dye plants. Um, and then uh, they're either processed in sort of two different ways. I either um, use an eco bundling technique that you can see here, my sort of cursors over that, or I process the dyes by um, soaking and simmering them to make a dye bath in order to achieve a flat color. Um, after the works are dyed, um, they're then washed and dried. All of my work, um, my illustrations are done in the computer first, and then I um, get silk screens um, made and I hand print all of the designs uh, with a natural dye print paste that I also produce here in my studio. Then it goes through um, steaming to set all of the dyes in the fiber, uh, neutralization, and then um, more washing. Some of my scarves, like the one that I'm wearing now, uh, has an additional step of um, applying a resist. Um, either through um, a mud resist or a, um, a uh, beeswax batik. And then they are um, dunked in a, an indigo vat and I use a fructose um, henna indigo vat. Uh, then there's some more sort of washing and neutralization. And then I hand roll hem all of the scarves that I create. And these are a couple pictures of me hemming down below. Um, but before I get into all of my natural dye work, I wanted to sort of go back to where this idea of creating scarves to send messages came about. So I graduated from uh, SCAD with a BFA in fibers. And one of the classes that I uh, took was an advanced screen printing class where <clears throat> we were instructed to create a um, screen printed silk scarf. And I ended up creating five silk scarves and um, sort of titled the series Homogenous. And this series is all about taking these um, classifications, these scientific classifications that are generally relegated to non-human organisms and using them and using my illustrations to sort of point back that these classifications actually can be designated to humans as well. Uh, the first in the series is this Red Queen Dynamics scarf, and this shows a uh, co-evolutionary process between a predator and a prey and how these um, two organisms co-evolve over generations. And it's, um, the process is called Red Queen Dynamics because in the Lewis Carroll uh, novel, Through the Looking Glass, the Red Queen says, it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. The second in the series is the particle scarf. Every single thing on the planet, when you boil it down, is made up of the same basic particles. The invasive scarf shows a gypsy moth sort of devouring a tree canopy. But then you see on the um, bottom right, there is sort of this urban sprawl, this suburbia also destroying the tree canopy. Parasite, um, lots of mosquitoes, but then in the four corners, you see the oil drills, um, lots of fossil fuel extraction, probably makes um, humans the largest parasite on the planet. And then the last scarf in the series is extinct. 99% um, of every species that has ever lived on the planet is now extinct and um, humans are not exempt from becoming extinct. And I think it's actually more evident to me now than it was when I created this scarf with the acceleration of climate change. So after I graduated from SCAD, I actually took a year off and um, joined AmeriCorps NCCC, which is a um, sort of a community service program. And I was stationed in the Midwest 
and really learned a lot about uh, the prairie ecology. And that'll sort of, you'll see that in the rest of my bodies of work, the influence from my time there. Um, but when I moved back to Savannah after AmeriCorps, I started my studio and I knew I really wanted to get back into making these scarves with this same sort of concept of using sci like science that isn't really relegated to humans and then sort of showing how it has this human connection. Um, but I knew I didn't want to use those synthetic dyes um, and I had taken a natural dye class and um, had a great book by India Flint who has pioneered this eco bundling technique. And so I started experimenting with different plants that I found in my neighborhood and some things that I was growing in order to get modeled color or these plant prints. So essentially what you do for eco bundling is you take a plant material and you sandwich it in um, wet mordanted fabric, you steam it and as the plant um, decomposes a bit, it releases its color and, and leaves these nice patterns. And so I was printing black uh, natural dye print paste on top of that in order to achieve some color because at this time I didn't know how to make a print paste to screen print with from plant dyes. And another way that I was able to add another layer of color was to start doing this batik work. And so I was um, uh, applying a um, beeswax over the illustration and putting that in an indigo vat to get these this multicolor effect. And this piece, um, sh the illustration is a number of different moths and it's titled Progress in the Dark. Sometimes the overlooked and disregarded play the most important roles. The second scarf that I created is the one mini much scarf. Um, this small organism being perceptive and interacting within its environment has the power to create change across an entire landscape. And you can see I'm also using that eco bundling technique layering on a print on top of that. But by this time I had also um, volunteered at the Textile Society of America symposium that was hosted by SCAD in Savannah and I met Catherine Ellis who is a natural dyer and artist and she shared with me her recipe for um, that she gathered from historical texts on creating natural dye print paste. So I also started experimenting with painting in different colors. This is logwood, the dark purple, the, and cochineal here in the pink. Um, and at the same time, I was also experimenting more with applying the batik in different ways in order to get um, different layering effects. Probably my most produced um, scarf or kerchief as I call them is the prairie kerchief. And in this process, I started to really um, dive into flat dyeing um, fabrics, eco bundling and um, flat dyeing are sort of two different ballparks and take sort of different skill sets. And I also started experimenting with more historical dyes that I knew would give me fast, strong color like um, matter root and um, cochineal here. Um, and at the bottom, you can see there's this sort of ombre effect. This is actually a more recent batch that I did where I'm using multiple dye baths in order to achieve um, multiple colors on one scarf with the print over top. And all of my scarves also come with um, a reclaimed cotton pouch um, that has printed care instructions on the back. And then they also come with an essay that I write about the topic. So it has information, this one specifically about prairies and then, that, and then about what we can do to sort of um, create more diversity in our landscapes and maybe bring back some of those prairies. Um, prairie ecosystems once covered 40% of the United States landscape and today less than 1% remains. The loss of these ecosystems has resulted in a loss of biodiversity, soil fertility, and massive flooding and toxic water runoff across the United States. And this is because these perennial plants that have these really long um, intricate root systems are, are very sparsely placed now across the United States. 
And these root systems really harbored um, these very rich soil ecosystems, which is why the soil in the first place was very fertile and great for planting crops. Um, and this root system also um, really brings down the rainwater and captures it in the soil, which helps to prevent uh, flooding and, and runoff. And it also um, has the ability to, um, to filter all of the water as well. Um, and so we have these sort of monocultural systems across the United States that um, no longer have fertile soil because um, they don't have this root system anymore. And so they need this excess fertilizer. And um, in addition to the monocultural farming, we also have probably the largest monoculture in the United States, which is our lawns. And that's circled here in yellow. And you can see those tiny little root systems that all of the lawns across the United States have. And that brings me to the dead zone kerchief. Um, which sort of brought my focus a little a bit in a way away from the Midwest and the prairie um, down to my home state of Louisiana. Um, every spring, uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico experiences a dead zone. Um, dead zones occur when there is um, excess fertilizer, um, mostly from all of these <clears throat> Midwestern states. Um, the runoff of the fertilizer finds its way into the watershed and goes down to the mouth of the Mississippi River along with um, industrial waste and sewage accumulates in the Gulf of Mexico and it's a really wonderful food source for algae. So the algae bloom and they feast on all of this excess nutrients and as the algae die they fall down to the um, to the to the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. And um, as they're eaten by bacteria, that process uses up oxygen and it leaves the water with either a low concentration or no oxygen. So all of the marine life either leaves the area because they can't breathe, or if they can't leave, they just die. Um, and so this dead zone not only affects the ecosystem of the Gulf of Mexico in the food chain, it also really harms the local economy because the Gulf Coast really relies on, on fishing for their income. Probably the largest scarf that I, or the largest scarf that I've made so far, the one that I'm currently wearing, um, is the Pesti Pollinators and Manufactured Landscapes scarf. And you can see I have gone back to this eco bundled um, base layer technique and printing on top. Um, this time with this scarf, instead of using beeswax, um, I used a mud resist. Um, and this scarf is all about the loss of biodiversity of pollinators across really the world. Um, but when we spray pesticides to target just one pest, we end up killing an estimated 1,700 beneficial insects. 40% of the world's insect species are on track to go extinct in the next few decades. And this is really concerning and devastating because 90% of all plant species need the help of pollinators in order to create their next generation. And so this sort of goes back to that same idea of this um, industrial farming where you have you, not only to put fertilizer down in order to grow the crops, but you are also having to douse these crops with different insecticides and herbicides um, because the lack of biodiversity gets rid of um, the na uh, natural predators of the pests that are eating the plants. Um, and it's also linked to this lawn system that we have because we're also sort of spraying our lawns in order to keep them um, homogenized and, and green and, and uh, one single plant. Um, and this also uh, relates as well to mos mosquito spraying. When you spray for mosquitoes, you don't just kill mosquitoes. Um, but to sort of say on this same topic, I decided to sort of look at this issue from a different angle. So the native pollinator kerchief comes with the same pesty essay with all that same information, but instead of 
um, looking at all the, at the dead in, insects, I decided to sort of celebrate the life of the insects instead. And so this kerchief comes with a pollinator key. So you're actually able to identify the different insects on the scarf and hopefully um, when you're in your backyard be able to spot the different insects um, because I think the more that you know about something the more that you tend to care about it and the more that you care about something the more likely you are to try to fight to save it. Um, and this brings me to um, an area of the, uh, the lower Mississippi River in Louisiana between Baton Rouge and New Orleans that is known uh, to the scientific community as Cancer Alley. Um, this area uh, produces and manufactures a lot of those synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and other petrochemicals um, that I talked about before. And this area is not only known as Cancer Alley, it is also known as my home. I'm from a small parish here in the center of Cancer Alley known as St. James Parish. And I only learned about um, the fact that this area was called Cancer Alley when I took an environmental science class in college. And so ever since I've gone back, I've been very hyper aware of the different industry and plants that are in the area, um, as well as the incoming plants that I sort of see pop up every time I go home. In the map to the right, um, everywhere that is sort of a blue outline, those are existing facilities. And then everywhere that is red, um, that is land that is for sale um, to industry pending, they get the um, permits that they're required to build. And so with that knowledge, I decided to start this project that is an ongoing investigation of the water quality in this area using matter root as a vehicle. Matter root is a historical natural dye whose root systems have a very large quantity of colorants that can produce a large array of colors. And so what I did is um, I, on two of my trips home, I collected a liter mason jar full of water from various um, water sources, including rivers, lakes, bayous, swamps, canals. And then I, and there's a map here on the left that shows you sort of where I've collected. And then I added a tablespoon of ground matter root to each jar and then let it sit overnight. And then I emptied the contents of the jar into a stainless steel pot to make a dye bath. Um, and then in that dye bath, I included four different fabric swatches. So you can see in the results here, each row is a different type of fabric. So there is an alum mordanted silk habitat, which is a protein fiber, an alum mordanted cotton, which is a cellulose fiber, no mordant silk habitat, and a no mordant cotton. So I knew that doing this project that each row would die differently. But what I was curious about is if each column would come out differently because each column represents a different water sample. And I do think that I got a very wide range of results, um, seeing as they sort of all these um, examples came from fresh water in the same area. And I have a, um, a much larger, larger uh, detailed analysis of this project that I'm going to be posting uh, on my website before the end of this month. So if any of you are interested in sort of diving into this uh, project that I'm working on, um, you can either sign up for my newsletter, that information will be on my last slide, um, or follow me on Instagram and I'll be posting and updating about when that goes live. So while I do have a number of other iterations of this project and things that I wanna do continuing this project on. Probably my, my biggest takeaway that I've found from doing this project is that the pollution in the area is very quiet. It's mostly invisible. There is no big event that makes you think that the area is toxic, um, but it is very pervasive. Um, and just as it's 
relatively difficult for me to actually pinpoint what chemical or what combination of chemicals or substances in the water are giving me these different results. It is just as, or probably even more difficult to pinpoint or prove what chemicals or what plant um, is causing the different diseases and, ca and cancers that some of the residents are experiencing in this area. Um, and the really alarming thing is that um, there are more plants coming to the area. So um, I know that there are substances that are being released into the area because the um, state and parish governments are permitting these plants to release these toxic, have these toxic releases, um, and it's public knowledge. And so um, one of the biggest projects coming into St. James Parish here is Formosa Plastics. It is going to be a 14 complex single use plastics facility. It is going to double the amount of toxic um, air in the parish that's already there. So this one plan is going to double the amount of toxic emissions. Um, it will be the um, largest new source of greenhouse gases uh, in the United States. It is going to be built on top of newly discovered grave sites of enslaved people in a predominantly black community um, and built just one mile away from a local elementary school. And it will displace or destroy um, 100 acres of wetlands. Um, but luckily there are a number of residents as well as um, organizations that are doing really wonderful, powerful work in order to combat not only Formosa, but other facilities coming in, challenge the parish and the state, as well as other EPA rules that have uh, recently changed. And those are um, Rise St. James, uh, Louisiana Bucket Brigade, and Healthy Golf. And I would really encourage all of you to take some time, look into these organizations. They have some really important petitions that they have going around. And if you're able to please support them with a, with a donation, uh, specifically um, Rise St. James. And with that, I will sort of look into the future. I have two new designs that I'm working on and they both are about um, plastic waste. Um, and this is um, sort of going to be one of them. This is a repeat pattern I created a number of years ago, but I'm going to be um, making it into a kerchief using um, some new natural dye techniques that I'm really excited um, to, to try out. Um, and in the lower right-hand corner, um, that is my website where you can sign up for my newsletter or you can follow me on Instagram at Jamie Bourgeois. And that is the end of my presentation. Fabulous. Um, thank you, Jamie. That was so educational. <laughs> um, I knew you were like detail oriented and scientific minded, but I didn't know to what degree and, um, that whole um, part about the matter route towards the end. That was really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And um, it's really wonderful how you're also um, I knew that you were ecologically minded in the work that you were doing, but I really got the depth of that through your sharing today. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, will anyone else have any comments or questions? Um, you can either raise your Zoom hand or we're kind of a small group. You could probably just come off of mute. Yeah, hi, Jamie, it's Anne. Um, I'm just wondering your last design, the new piece that you're working on, um, wh what is the background? <coughs> what are those little things that are um, floating in amongst all the plastic? Uh, those are zooplankton. And what? Zooplankton, they're sort of like the beginning of the building. Oh, zooplankton. Chain, um, in mm -hmm. the oceans and so, uh, there's zooplankton mixed in with microplastic 
And a lot of um, the fish and the things that feed on zooplankton are getting confused um, and eating the plastic instead. And so the, that's one way that the, um, that the microplastics are getting into the food chain, but then microplastics are also sort of um, consolidating in the oceans and blocking the sunlight. So it's, it's harming the zooplankton because they're not able to get the sunlight and uh, go through photosynthesis. Hmm. Cool. So sort of a number of different ways of how plastic is, is affecting not only the oceans, but eventually us, because if we eat the fish, we end up eating some of those microplastics as well. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was, is the, um, your kerchiefs that are multicolored, what's your dye process? Do you over dye on every piece or do you dip half and then another piece and another piece? Like what's the process? It's sort of both. So I start off with, um, um, I mordant the fabric. I usually mordant with an, um, an alum mordant, which is a potassium aluminum sulfate. Um, and then I will dye the fabric in an ombre in one dye bath. So let's just say I use um, matter root. Um, I, I dip most of the scarf in the pot and then I have like a hanging system where I drape part of the um, a tip over and so part of it's hanging and then after maybe like 30 minutes I'll like move it up and then I'll move it up and so I get one ombre and then I go in with an, an additional color and I do sort of the same thing. So it's it is dip dyed and um, ombre in a number of different pots. Yeah, you're welcome. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Hello, Jamie. Oh, where where can we, um, are your scarves displayed anywhere? They're, right now they're all on my website, uh, which is jamiebourgeois.com. Uh, so you can see the works that are available and then you can also see it under the shop section. And then if you go under the works section, there are, um, information uh so there's the essays some of the scars and then the process as well and yeah because i can't see them really well because we're on zoom and i'm on my smartphone uh -huh. so i i love i love the idea and the materials and they look beautiful and i made a promise that i would not buy anything <laughs> in 2021 i have scads of stuff That's and i would still like to look at your yeah. you know up close with the with the um, review or what you were saying, the essay. Yeah, yeah, they're all up on my website. And if you're local to Atlanta, um, I work over at Spalding Nix Fine Art and I do bring in my scarves from time to time. So if anybody wants to see them in person, I can always bring work there. We're located over in Buckhead, so. Yes, unfortunately I'm in Poland, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be a no, but I'm sure Karina will look and go and ogle and admire on my behalf. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you as a proud owner of two and have gifted several to family and friends, they're stunning. And when you see her handwork and just, especially when you see the ombre and just really the care that Jamie puts into telling you the story the incredible packaging. It's just, it's just a, a, a wonderful thing to own and a really great gift to give. Whenever I've given it as a gift, people are really wowed by it. And it's also such an important story for us to, to be aware of. I own the native pollinator one, so it's the celebration, but I've given the, other, the others to uh, family and they love them and they in turn have given them as gifts. So it's a nice way to, to get uh, Jamie's uh, message out as well as you give them as gifts. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, did I put your, um, your, face, your Facebook, your, um, let's say right, your um, um, website correctly in the thing, in the um, chat? Oh, let me check. No, but I'll fix it. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was like, I put it in there. I was like, wait a minute. I think I, I did. I, thank you. There it is. Of course, looking quickly. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Hi, man. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm Betsy Stark. I'm a urban planner and I just love all your focus on the whole geography of that area and, and involving that, expressing that through your art. I mean, that's, I, I make puppets and I do a lot of woodland characters. Um, so um, I just really appreciate seeing how another artist and you're so technical. Um, I just think it's fabulous. So thank you and I'm following you now on Instagram. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. I just wanted to piggyback off of Anne. Well, <laughs> also amazing work. I mean, it's just so inspiring to, to hear the philosophy behind everything. And can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, great. Um, but yeah, to piggyback off of Anne with the, um, the plastics piece, I know that you incorporate a lot of like your local kind of um, floral and off of Anne. Well, <laughs> guys, but um, also, amazing work. I what mean, kind of, so I'm sorry, I hear an echo. What kind of um, materials are you planning on using for your plastics piece? I'm going to use the silk cotton fabric, I think, I think. Um, to do more kerchiefs, but the but actually the techniques that I am interested in using, I may have to use sort of more of a lightweight cotton, just because um, silk fabrics have a greater affinity for natural dyes, and so um, the techniques that I want to use with mordant printing, um, there would be lots of like sort of staining where the mordant isn't printed. So I have a, you know, a couple of experiments that I'm going to work on, um, but probably silk cotton to cotton. Also, thank you. Jamie, you might have said this earlier, um, but what was it that had you choose to use the format of um, the scarf as opposed to any other format that you could? Well, I, um, when I was at SCAD, I did that one project. Mm -hmm. um, and really, so I, I think I, I went to school and I really wanted to be a painter, but I was too scared to do it because I didn't know what kind of job you can get as a painter. <laughs> and so um, I started doing fashion design and then I quickly switched to fibers. And um, most of the, my work in the fibers program were actually these like sculptural, sculptural wearable pieces um, that were um, less functional. And then um, my senior year, I had to sort of get my portfolio together and I needed to get a job. And so I sort of wanted to do some sort of print pattern work, um, but still keep it conceptual um, and make art pieces out of it, not just have just like a print pattern portfolio. And so when I took the um, screen printing class and we had to do the scarf, um, and I went in the direction I did with the Red Queen Dynamic scarf, I thought it was a really great way to merge this um, sort of illustration and pattern work with something that was more conceptual um, that like sort of went with my um, ideas about um, the environment. And then I realized that it could be used as a, this tool to spread information um, and I started to eventually write these essays that went along with it, hoping to sort of arm the person who was wearing it with knowledge. And so it's kind of become this, I look at it as this overall, in a way, performance piece, because I am get, trying to activate people to do an action. Um, so when I imagine these in the, out in the world, I imagine someone saying, oh, like beautiful scarf, like what, where'd you get it? And the person says, oh yeah, well, let me tell you about the pollinator um, decline and like sort of to talk about um, those environmental topics. That's really great. Like as a conversation starter yeah. in the direction that you want, the train's coming by here, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> a conversation starter really because you have people interacting with them. Um, mm -hmm. Great. We have a few new people that have joined. Um, does Hi. That Hi, Shannon. Hi, Karina. Um, I, Jamie, um, 
I'm also from the Gulf Coast. My name is Shannon Morris, and I'm a um, gallery director in Augusta. And this is a subject that I've actually done exhibitions about and studied myself too. And I was wondering if, like with the dye process, especially the matter route, um, you know, if you're also thinking about the, you know, the racial history there as well, in terms of, you know, the the history of the dye um, and, um, you know, the African American, the, the connection to Africa and and all of those things, mm -hmm. it, it really kind of comes together. Um, you know, in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I've i thought about too, trying to use um, cotton that was grown, that could have been grown sort of in the area. There's sort of like a, um, uh, what do they call it? Like a, it's a colored cotton or Creole cotton that was grown mm -hmm. in the United, in, in Louisiana specifically. Mm -hmm. I tried, tried to think about using materials that would be directly from the Louisiana landscape um, because indigo was actually the biggest crop there before sugar cane was, um, but indigo doesn't really give you that range or it, it's not a mordant mm -hmm. dye, so it doesn't really get affected by different chemicals. Um, yeah. So Red, I mean, that mordant dye is the first dye used um, on fabrics, though, correct? I it, mean, like, uh, I don't know that it, when, like, they started dyeing, um, you know, creating prints onto fabrics. I think the first, um, the first color was red because yeah. of that mordant dye. Yeah, it may be, but that and then, yeah. Yeah, all that is kind of tied into like the international connection of um, printmaking um, onto fabrics and um, the Dutch and East Indies Company and slavery. So you're kind of like have this big, huge. Mm -hmm. There's actually this great artist that I've learned from, uh, Lavin Yamani. She's a contemporary Kalamkari artist um, who is from and based in India. And um, I learned um, some of her techniques uh, and she, Matarut is the main dye that she uses. Mm -hmm. And if you're you should definitely look her work up because her work is not only using this traditional technique that is um, that is sort of what chintz fabric, how chintz fabric was made, mm -hmm. um, but she also is talking about colonialism and slavery and women's work in her imagery that she's using. Mm -hmm. So her work is really cyclical and has these really wonderful connections. I'll put her name over in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any Louisiana um, influences like other artists that you I know there are a number of Louisiana artists who who work um, uh, in this vein of of the environment and especially the dead zone and all of that runoff stuff um, unfortunate um, occurrence but um, are there any Louisiana artists that you're influenced by yeah, Hannah Chalu is an artist that I'm really inspired by. She um, is a New Orleans based artist and her work is very much about uh, the environment and pipe the pipelines and her studio practice is also very reflective of her work as well. She tries to be um, to use like low impact um, processes and she um, actually creates, she makes her own paper from the byproduct of the sugar cane that's um, grown mm -hmm. and manufactured mm -hmm. there. Um, and she also sort of will infuse it with these like plastic bits and all of her inks she makes from um, gall nuts and iron. So her work is also sort of um, branches a little bit into that natural dye world in a way. Um, mm -hmm. It's really great, yeah. Cool. Thank you. It's hey. my pleasure. Rich dialogue today. <laughs> it's such a heavy subject. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you for joining us, Shannon. Uh, Jamie, I just wanted to talk to you about, you know, your process because 
Like how long does it take you to make one scarf? And you hand stitch every edge. And I watched this video of yours where you do this technique where you go into the fabric and then you catch another piece and then you go back down and then you zipped it all at once. And it just went like dominoes, you know, this like technique that you have. So how long does it take to make one scarf? <laughs> <clears throat> I've tried to figure out how long it takes me um, to make one scarf. I usually do everything in batches and now I'm up to doing like a batch of um, anywhere from like 20 to maybe 40 at a time where I'm sort of dyeing everything or scouring everything, mordanting everything, dyeing, then printing and then steaming. Um, and it takes me Probably, I mean, I also work full time, so it's hard for me and I do, so I do this on the weekends. So um, I could say probably two months to do all of that work when I have the time on the weekends. Um, and then it takes me, now I'm down to uh, like 45 minutes to an hour to hem each one. <laughs> and so when That's I'm- like, amazing. <laughs> when I'm like, so oh. these scarves, they're like five, $600 each, right? No, no, they, no. The, kerchief, the kerchiefs are, I think, at um, 85 now. Because um, I also, you know, and I've, thought, I've raised my prices incrementally over time, but I also want these to remain somewhat accessible because the whole point is to sort of spread this information. So if I make them so expensive that people can't purchase them or that only people with so much money can purchase them, then it kind of, in a way, it doesn't defeat the purpose because I know that I need to, you know, make the money that my time is worth, but I'm trying to sort of find that balance and, and um, yeah, so. Do you think so, men suffer from that same conflict? <laughs> Do you? Probably not, maybe not. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Jamie, I have a question. Do you ever see yourself, um, now that you work in a gallery and you see lots of painters and everything, do you ever see yourself full cycle coming back to, um, you know, maybe working on a canvas as well as having your very accessible scarves? Yeah, I actually have ideas and plans to do sort of smaller one-off pieces using um, different like mordant printing and column kari techniques that I learned from Lavinia as well as um, I have a good friend, Madeline McGarity, who does lots of mordant printing. Um, so they've both taught me a lot and I'm interested in doing smaller works. And then um, I also have been over the past five years collecting pieces of plastic that I am hoping to make into beads and do some beading work with the plastic that I've collected mm -hmm. to sort of embellish some of my illustrations that are, um, that are made from natural dyes that will then talk about this sort of new plastic concept. So I do have plans. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, Jamie, um, I, I'm so impressed with your whole process and even more than your process, I'm really impressed with the, um, all the ideas that you have and your love of the environment and where you come from and being able to bring that all together to create these pieces. And um, I need to get one of those scarves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've talked about it, but I was like today when Patty was sitting, I was like, yeah, wait a minute. I need to next time. <laughs> next time I come to the gallery, I want to see some in person. <laughs> yeah, I'll bring them. Awesome. Well, um, let's see, this has been such a rich conversation and um, we're getting ready to wrap up, but I don't want to end. Does anyone else have any last comments or questions before we bring this to a close today? Okay, wonderful. Well, um, I just want to say thank you once again, Jamie. Um, you did such a wonderful job of um, putting your presentation together and sharing and thank you, Shannon and, a and Anne and Annalise and Betsy and um, everyone else who's in the audience, those of you that have um, uh, interacted here today. And uh, I really do, every time I do this uh, show, I, I think, God, I'm so happy I do this, you know? <laughs> so um, if you yourself um, or you know someone who has a, a great story to tell, um, I take uh, submissions and um, I 
I always forget to put it in, but you can get a hold of me in um, on karinasephora.com is my website um, or karinasephora at gmail.com. Um, and, uh, and feel free to let me know if you have a presentation that you'd like to share. And um, until next week, uh, thank you so much for being here. And once again, this is Connect and Create. And thank you, Fulton County Council for the Arts for the generous grant funding um, to produce this show. And we look forward to seeing you next week for episode 46. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Annalise, all the way from Poland. You make us international. <laughs> It's not the first time. See you Friday, Karina. Okay, see you Friday. Bye.